Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Eternity. As you near, you feel a vibrant history contained in the essence of this man's soul. Voices from its past seem to call out to you. You see a man soar through the air, hitting a nearby wall with a nauseating crunch. He doesn't get up. His attacker, a burly, clean-cut warrior with a carnivorous grin, turns and shoves his fist into the stomach of another assailant, removing another from the impromptu brawl. The bar is a whirlwind of elbows, knees, fists and feet, with no end inside, and he, he is in his element. In the corner, three smaller men speak quietly, throwing malicious glances at the larger man in the center. He breaks a chair over a tattooed head, cackling. The trio position themselves in three parts of the room, and with a terse note they charge. Unfortunately for them, the man sees them coming. Something in his eyes burns brightly, and all three slump to the ground in an agony that's all in their minds. The burly man bro bows to a room of the unconscious and incapacitated before sauntering out, off Gewissel trailing behind him. I don't think there's a need for us to read all of those. Not sure how I feel about this. Okay. Crammed behind the books is a drawing that shows EFS and Lord Frederick in a compromising position. No other land has such a wild and bloody recent history. From colony to palatinate to free republic, the Deerwood has undergone a trial by fire to emerge as a powerful force of the Eastern Reach. Deerwood's history actually begins in Adir in 2602 AI. Adir explorers return from a journey across the ocean with tales of the treasure they would found. They would discover countless ruins scattered through the forests, as well as plains to the north of the trees that would be perfect for growing warlocks. There was a problem, however. The locals were hostile and there was potential for conflict. The Ferkoning of Adir, Ferkoning, first king, knew that this was too good an opportunity to pass up and sent more explorers to scout and map the area. Exploration continued over the next 20 years. Small groups of explorers traveled back and forth between Aeria and this new world with a handful of colonists setting up small camps to establish a base for the explorers to walk out of. Conflicts with the locals, who the Aedirians learned are called the Glanfadans, were rare, but frequent enough for the Ferconi to send a small squadron of guards to help protect his citizens. These guards established a central base on a river in the western section of the woods. This settlement would eventually become the city of Deerford, upon which the modern Dane village of the same name is presently built. Once that base was established, the first permanent Aedirian settlements began north and west of the Bale River. Over the next three years, thousands of Aedirians made the trek from Aedir to this new land. The Glanfadans, who seemed to revere the ruins scattered through the forest, caused a few problems with some of the settlements, especially those found near the ruins themselves. These were easily taken care of by the colonists with the help of the Imperial Guard. The Aetherians, in order to further their foothold in the area, reduced the cost of production, and in an attempt to keep the Glamfadan population under control, started making slaves out of any Glamfadans captured during the uprisings. This resulted in a great increase in tension between the two groups. With the population of the area growing, an official governmental structure was established by the First Uning. He appointed several earls to preside over the land and assigned them thanes to help run their territories, and they called the new Griffram the Deerwood. Therefore, to remain the center for the Imperial Guard, but the settlement in Pearlwood Gulf, New Dunrit, was the true seat of power for the area. 
Sitting at the edge of the ocean, forest, fertile farmland and a river that runs from the coast to the white marsh, settlers flock to the area, hoping to establish names for themselves. Aether began to spread across the new land. Is there any room for us? Ooh. These bones are covered in tiny bite marks. This hound stares intently at the covered window, head cocked as if waiting to hear a particular sound. It looks up when you approach and winds a low note, tail wagging slightly. Get it. The dog's tail thumps happily against the floorboards. Hmm. Uh, what I wanted to see was our... Yep. Hmm, yeah, we've been hearing things. Resting the animal who looks in the manor, okay. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yep. Uh, the innkeeper has suggested he may have come to, to harm on the road through the veil wood. Veil wood. But we are not supposed to leave yet, right? So I think it's best if we do not leave, as the guy suggested. Instead, I would really like to use a room. <laughs> no, no, I'm not gonna steal your stuff. Of course I'm gonna steal your stuff. Roof just scatter and flee under the crates. Hmm. Okay, so to buy a room, I guess we must talk to you first, Baska. Uh, I'd like a room, please. That's for tourists. Plus one perception, plus one mechanics. How much we have? This much. Okay. Stash? Your sleep is restless and fevered, assaulted by hisses and whispers blanketed with a suffocating anxiety. You open your eyes to awaken and find yourself in front of gilded veils gulf's tree, the creaking of its ropes growing louder in your mind until the sound is deafening. Hanging from the tree is an old dwarf woman whose face is has shriveled inward like moldering fruit. Her head hangs limply to one side. As you look at her, she looms larger and larger in your mind until she is mere inches from your face. Suddenly, her head snaps up and her eyes open, and they are empty and behind them is a vast nothingness that makes your stomach drop. Her mouth slowly parts and with a gust of rancid air, she speaks a word. Water. You jolt awake, the foul smell of the dwarf woman's breath still permeating your nostrils. Sweat runs down your face in thick droplets and your skin is soaked from head to toe. You remember the woman. You remember seeing her decaying face when you spoke with the magistrate. He called her an animancer. Though it fills you with a new, queasy apprehension, you feel a strange compulsion to see this woman once more, if only to confirm she is truly dead. Okay, yes, let's do that. Hopefully it will be day now. It is, but it's still raining. The squat, distant body of an elderly dwarf woman dangles from a thin, crooked boat that sags at the tag of her nose. 
the bloated purple flesh of her neck, worn away in patches like moth eaten linen, bulges over the rope that suspends her, and her lifeless head blows forward frigidly from one side to the other when the breeze shifts. You perceive a faint glow around her that casts no light on its surroundings, but there is a tepid warmth to it, and you feel somehow that you could reach out and touch it, not with your hands, but with some aspect of yourself that has no worldly dimension. Reach out for her. You take a deep breath, clearing your mind, focusing on your objective. As you exhale, you feel yourself spreading out toward the hanging woman, perceiving all that lies between you and her with new, unfamiliar awareness. Once you have expanded enough to reach her, there is a sudden jolt to your mind. A ringing, electric surge of images and words and sounds. Involuntarily, you shut your eyes and feel yourself being pulled down to some deeper consciousness in a space occupied only by you and the hanging woman. And when you open them again, she's staring at you with eyes clouded in a milky fog, her body still swaying in a wind with new wind you no longer feel from a tree that stands planted in a misty void. The woman gives a slow nod of her head the rope creaking as she does so, and she smiles at you. Have you come here for me, dear, or have you gotten lost? Ah, uh, it is both, I think, yes? I need to understand something that's happened to me. She nods, a look of pity on her face as though consoling a child. The world looks a little different than it used to, is that it? Feels like you're noticing things for the first time that have always been there. She nods. You have seen past the shroud. It only takes an instant. Your soul remembers, yes? remembers how it sees when it leaves the body, like being reminded of a dream you had forgotten. You are a watcher now, and the watcher you will stay. What's a watcher? What indeed? Long hours have many animancers spent studying such things. Not I. Not I. I'll tell you what I know, though, since fair is fair, and here we are visiting you and I, and it reminds me of better times. Souls pass on, some say through Audra stones, which are the blood veins of the world. They leave the world for a time and are reborn into it, sometimes more than they were before, but usually less and seldom the same. For all souls, there is a time where they do not live, yet have not passed on. And those souls roam the world, same as you or I, either leaving or lost. But no one sees them because they have forgotten how. A watcher sees, though, knows what to look for. And sometimes they know a person just by looking at them. Know where they've been in ages past when their bodies were other bodies. See memories even their owner can't recall. A wonder to behold when all goes well. A wonder. What did you mean when all goes well? Oh, nothing to be afraid of, I'm sure. It's just much to take in for some. Sometimes there's trouble sleeping or other difficulties. She smiles at you shunglingly, fanning out a tuft of long whiskers that sprouts from one of her cheeks. You should see old Meerwald. He could tell you much more than I. A watcher just like you. Helped many in his day. Took up in an old keep no one would claim. Not far, not far. Kadnua, beyond the Black Meadow. He will welcome the company. 
Mere world. Black Meadow, you say? I think I survived a bear, but do you know what why that would be? Did you now, dear? My, that would be something, wouldn't it? Could be luck, could certainly be. A storm can be a careless thing. Or maybe it got its hands around your soul but couldn't pick it up. A soul can be heavy if it stayed in one piece through its time. Strong souls, we call them in the trade. Cold, I mean. Cold them. Those days are all behind me, no? You said souls break apart over time? Oh, yes. Entropy. Rima Gan's work. We know little of why or how. We lose pieces of ourselves when we die and pick up pieces of others when we are born again. But less than what we lost. We tried to stop it with the animantic sciences, but with little success. No, no. A very small few resist Rimergan's influence and stay together through some force of defiance, at least for a time. But they all succumb eventually, I think. She clicks her tongue. I want to know something about you. Me? <laughs> I'll bore you to tears, though. Who are you? And here I thought you'd come to visit me in particular. Caldara de Baranzi of the Valian Royal Academy of Animantic Sciences. Not the greatest of their number, but I came here all the same because this was where help was needed. What happened to you? She laughs, a rasping choke. Cackle escaping between rows of battery yellow teeth, causing her body to bob up and down with each spasm. Seeing your blank expression, she catches herself. <laughs> oh, come now! Such a question! As though the answer were plain as a rope tied for strangling! Allow an old dwarf her last bit of cheer! <laughs> Well, I came where I was needed, didn't I? Offered my services to Lord Radric for a pittance. A humble pittance. I was to examine the Lord's wife. See why the gods have seen fit to poison her womb. Studied her for months. Looked high and low for impurities. Tested her balance. The permeability of her essence. Do you know what I found? Tell me. Nothing at all. A healthy woman, head to toe, blessed with a beautiful soul. Such a sweet woman, too. Meek, but warm-hearted. A few months' time, and the lord of the house demanded answers. For a time, I told him what he wanted to hear. Oh, yes, my lord. She is riddled with imbalances. I must have time to cure her. As the birth drew near, he grew impatient, as lords do. And this is where I've ended up. What's an animal, sir? A student of the soul. Something so basic, yet so poorly understood. But so many breakthroughs have been made in my lifetime. Had been made. Had been. To hear the locals tell it, we're a gang of soul manglers that preys upon the weak-minded. And the worst of us are. But the best of us? The best? Inspirations. Miracle workers. My parents were soul twins. Miserable before they met. Empty inside. It was an animancer who helped one find the other. Turn their lives around. You wouldn't believe the stories. Amnesiacs helped to remember their lives. The suicidal brought back from the brink of oblivion. The elderly afforded extra moments to say their goodbyes. How soon we forget when we're afraid. It's a fascinating science. 
A fascinating time to be alive in a place like Deerwood that does not control the research, no? I love the Valian Republics for many things, but their recent caution will leave them behind, I fear. I think I have other questions. Of course, dear. How are you able to speak to me? Is that what we're doing? Perhaps it just seems that way. Perhaps it is the easiest way for your mind to make sense of it. I think it is a very good choice. Farewell. Goodbye, my dear. It was lovely visiting. Kaldara closes her eyes and her head slumps forward over the news. And your surroundings seem to bleed into your vision from some unknown place of waiting. Crucible of the soul. Olaf looks at you through narrowed eyes. Are you alright? You seemed lost just now. Yes, uh, I am fine. He folds his arms. That's good to know, but I don't suppose you could tell me what that was all about? All about? Um, I'm a watcher, apparently. His arch eyebrows recede into his hoop. Well, that's interesting. He gives you a sly grin. And I expected that explains how you survive at the Beavage, hmm? In any case, I appreciate your honesty. Since we're traveling together, it's probably wise for us to share these things. Do you know anything about waters? Only that they're rare and that they seem to have unique insights into certain soul conditions, <clears throat> as you just demonstrated. Let's go. Seventeen and a half. Okay. Let's now visit. What was it called? Veilwood. North. Yep. Isn't that from the cookie that we are looking for? Wait, wait, can I? No, we don't really have a minimap. Oh, there's a body here. They're all okay. Okay, he is badly injured. Certainly. Yeah, to stash? No. Oh, there's the cave. Someone was talking something about the cave, weren't they? What the hell? Okay. It's young barrel, luckily, and I think that will be our cook. We are doing fine. A figure drifts suspended in the musty air of the cavern. Its form and features blur and twist in cascading ripples of incandescence. You feel its energy eddying about your limbs, filling them with a heavy chill. Reach out. You reach out a hand for the spirit. In the moment of contact you feel as if you have been struck a blow, head reeling as you tumble helplessly in the waiting darkness. 
Light bloom at the edges of your vision. You feel the sun at your back and the weight of a bow in your hand. You know suddenly that you have come a long way from the vale hunting deers. Now you are standing before a cavern and the darkness extends far into its depths. Even so, your friend strides out before you, his red cloak flapping at his heels. You follow heart hammering in your chest as he leads you deeper into the cavern. There is a roar like thunder echoing around you. Fear seizes you, casts you stumbling back toward the exit, towards the light and escape. You see a glint of steel and there is a sudden terrible flash of agony behind your knee. You scream, stumble, fall. Your faults are chaos, lanced through with pain. But in a moment of terrible clarity, you see your friend look back from the mouth of the cavern, his dagger doped in crimson to match his cloak. And then there is a great dark shape above you. And then there is more pain. The vision recedes and you are thrown back into yourself with seemingly resentful force. The corpse lies at your feet and the spectre lingers. In the span of energy between you both, you feel a sense of questioning of confusion, of anger. I met him on the road, your friend. A sudden, lashing anger emanates from the spirit. Rage and grief seem to pour from the gleaming figure like smoke. I'll find him and see that he answers for what he's done to you. For a moment the spirit seems to burn, bright and your head fills with a sickly triumph. The spirit seems to weaken with the force of its own exultation, growing fainter and fainter, until you are alone once more. What do we have here? Quarter stuff. Well, my scroll through eye sockets and over femurs. Okay, but that was not the cook we are we were looking for. I need to check that again. Um, so somewhere here. The struts and supports are large enough to be the ribs of vertebrae of a dragon. Couple? Mm, maybe I'll give it to you for now. This is still not it. Oh, Zorib camp. Maybe he's. Oh, you can't see it. Maybe he's somewhere here. The young dwarf tending to the stew looks up, startled, as he sees you approach. He drops his ladle, spattering stew across the ground. What? The bandit turns. Get here, you dogs, and make sure our new cook don't run off. Help, please, help! One of the bandits gives the ten ferf a kick as they pass him, and he huddles. Okay, you go for him, I'll go for this. I actually managed to screw up the targets. Oh, I believe I believe you will handle him perfectly. Okay, he is near death. Great. Please remind me not to piss you off. I wouldn't want to end up like this. Welcome. 
by the flame. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I thought I'd be stuck cooking for these ignorant weasels for the rest of my life. Or until they were bored with me, I suppose. Did Pasca send you? She must be beside herself. I, I, I must get back at once, but, but listen. The next time you're in Gilded Vale, make sure to drop by the Black Hound. I'll let her know what you've done for me, and I'm sure she will do right by you in turn. Oh, to be back on my oven again! The tent is empty, but for a pair of stained cots and a sting of unwashed bodies. Ooh, wand. Uh, that will be good for you, I suppose. And lots of food. Oh, uh, if you guys can find a way up here, that would be great. Some ruins we have here. Come on, Edna, don't get stuck. Don't get stuck. We really should check this new one for him. Um, so. You are. Oh, you have set there? I'm confused. It's two handed. You also have Grimoire, which. Uh, I don't understand how weapons work in here. Oh, well. Uh, would you like some hood? You have a hood. Some cape? You have a cape. Come on. Not that. Hmm. Doesn't really change anything for you. I don't think they... Uh, I cannot wear any helmet because of the horns. These aged walls appear to have once encircled the entire glade. Only a small fragment remains and the stairs leading to the top of the structure have crumbled away. Examine the wall. The heavy bricks are slick with moss, presenting a hindrance to climbing, but the stones themselves seem sturdy enough. Given the right tools, one might easily reach the top. Let's try scaling the wall. The crumbling wall is of a considerable height, even now, and its uneven surface promises a difficult climb. Who will scale it? I will. You find a handhold upon one of the large stones and start to pull yourself up, but the uneven bricks and odd angle of ascent make the climb difficult, and after a short distance your arms begin to burn too fiercely. You are forced to drop back down to the ground. So we would need mm, some tools. Okay, it's marked. So, for now, I'm gonna end this part here. Thank you very much. Stay alive and see you soon. Bye.